So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Dorset Historical Society's third Thursday lunchtime lecture. We're now into what our 13th year or something. Um, and it's amazing how there's so many different um, aspects of local history we still have to learn about. Um, and get updated. We've been doing this for so long that about 10 years ago, a guy called Kevin O'Toole did a presentation on the Pinnacle. And there's been so much going on there, we're here for the updates. Mm -hmm. Kevin O'Toole um, has been in the Dorset area since, what, 1972? And um, grew up in the village, went off, got, became a lawyer, and here he is again. Um, very interested in local history, a great asset to the community. And you'll find out all about his connection to the Pinnacle right now. Uh, join us afterwards for uh, cookies and drink um, in the reception area. Kevin O'Toole. Okay. Thank you. I've been around since 72. I've had my law office here since June, no, June 1st of 1986. So people may like me, may not, but they could identify the body if I got run over by a truck. <laughs> um, so anyway, I call this a personal history. Let's see if I know how to do this. Um, this is what's the Pinnacle Tower. I don't know if you've been there or not, but in 1972, I moved here from Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, well, uh, Ruth Gilbert's heard this before. But Ruth, there's a seat right back here. Um, anyway, uh, in 1972, I moved here from Fairfield, Connecticut between my uh, sophomore and junior years in high school. I went to Burn Burn um, afterwards. And um, the house, that we bought a house at the end of Kent Hill Road, just over here. And uh, anyway, it needed painting. And uh, the lawn was about three feet high. The lawn a manicured lawn and it needed mowing. The house had nine sides and 54 windows, if you remember that. Anyway, during breaks, we would go back into the forest and I discovered these manicured trails, all leading to this empty stone tower. I was reading The Lord of the Rings at the time, and I thought I had ventured onto Weathertop. The, the trails went all the way around in a circle leading up to the tower, and then all the way out down to the Medowee River. And I, I later learned that that was known as the Pinnacle. Now, the Pinnacle lands now, uh, so just a second here. Uh, okay, this is, an this is a topographical map. I didn't realize it was gonna look that small, but if you look, Right here, it doesn't show up on the screen. That's the pinnacle area, and it shows the roads around it. Okay, that's not quite as good a one. And then the next one, the town now owns uh, the pinnacle area, which is about 34 acres, all in here. Okay? And they also own uh, the actual roads of Pinnacle Lane that comes from Route 30 all the way up this way and goes out and all the way out into P Street via Oakland Lane, and it owns the beginning part of Hidden Hollow Lane. Okay, so the, the town actually owns uh, all of that. They own it through, what happened is it had used to be known by Cecilia de Notbeck, and she died uh, in 1933, and then uh, it was willed to her, her nephew, uh, Edgar, uh, Edward, who deeded it to the late Re uh, Reese Evans's mother and father, Albert and Doris Evans, who did a subdivision and everything. And they sold this to Bob Keeler. And Bob wanted to uh, build a house on the top of the pinnacle. He thought it'd be really grand. But then he married Peg Midhoffer, and she said, no way. <laughs> and she saw the house, the yellow house, uh, that's now owned by Willie Ferrone and Tara on P Street. And she said, we're, we're buying that, and you can keep your forest. And so the land just has been just doing a whole lot of nothing um, since then. So all it grew up, okay? So uh, Bob Keeler then willed it to Long Trail School. And, but there was restrictions on it. It had to be used for recreational or scientific purposes. <laughs> and they didn't want to pay taxes and not be able to build houses and raise money and things. So they said no. <laughs> and disclaimed the gift, and then it went to the town of Dorset. 
to the town of Dorset just has this. And so now the town of Dorset owns all of this land. And on the other side of P Street, Isabel Cutler in 1973 deeded 27 acres to the town. So we have two sort of private parks right in the middle of Dorset, which have hiking trails. Okay. Now this is a Charlie Stewart map that we have here. Now, um, Miss Denotbeck, um, I have a there's a detailed narrative of her life in, um, uh, there was a talk in 1985 by Robert Rudolph, the son of Bishop Rudolph, who she brought up here as a private minister. And I have a copy of that and we can make copies for you if you want more to know about Miss Denotbeck. But let me just give you a flavor of her. There's sort of conflicting things that I lead you to make your own conclusions, okay? In 1934, there was an appreciation by Reverend Carhart, the minister of the Congregational Church, and he called her a generous person with a warm and sympathetic heart who all the children loved. That's in 2013, Ariana Lynch, I said flippantly, I don't suppose anybody still remembers her personally. And Ariana Lynch, who might have been in her 90s then, raises her hand and said, we were all scared to death of her. <laughs> so I'm left with that. And then also uh, Bob Rudolph's talk, where he said she, her dress was sort of back in the, uh, the 19th century. She wore black and long skirts with high necks in the winter and white in the summer with petticoats, things like that. She was the great-granddaughter of John Jacob Astor, the furrier. And uh, he was a land baron, lots of things. And also, her, uh, her mother was the granddaughter of John Jacob Astor, and she was Cecilia Langdon. And uh, she married a John de Notbeck, who was the Russian consul to the Tsar of Russia. Okay, But he died when she was seven. In a, in a riding accident on a horse in New York City. And she was left uh, with her mother. And she had three siblings. And uh, they were schooled in England and in France. Cecilia knew English, German, French, Finnish, and Russian, and could read the Greek New Testament. So she was pretty well schooled. Her sister Eugenia, who has been called by her imperious, um, she, she stayed in Switzerland after she got married. Her two other siblings developed dementia and uh, eventually had to be put into what they called then an asylum. And Cecilia did visit them regularly. When she was young, she worked in a mission in New York City, to her credit, and she met uh, the Alta sisters and also a woman named Harriet Edwards, who she developed quite a devotion to. She wanted um, Harriet to come live with her, and uh, Harriet said, "No, I, the church that we work, you know, I'm working for, I have one more year of admission, but the church won't pay for it." And she said, "I will sponsor you at that last year in India for you, if you'll come live with me." And she said, "Okay," and that's what she did. And she later called uh, Harriet Ange uh, Edwards her angel. And after her death. Um, she developed uh, a relationship with a Miss Jefferson, Amanda Jefferson. And uh, when she died, she ended up getting a, a house for Miss Jefferson, a Sears house, a Sears catalog house, which is now owned by Ellen Stimson and John Russian. I can't help her. Anyway, um, just, I don't want to be uncharitable too much to her, but Robert Rudolph had a couple of lines that kind of give you a flavor. She was the nobility in Russia never stopped thinking that they were the nobility in Russia <laughs> and acted that way. So, Bob Rudolph writes this in 1985. It must be understood that for European nobility, no one who received a salary could be regarded as a friend. <laughs> a true friend like Miss Edwards, and later Miss Jefferson, would receive all her clothing and travel as part of being with his nothing. You know, so. She took pains to treat me as a friend. She <coughs> helped build the trails and did a lot of work for her. Um, <coughs> and never was any reference to any kind of payment. She just once in a while just says, I have a little something for you. And she, he writes this very curiously. 
The workmen did notice that she would always try to speak to them from above the steps of the porch of this mansion that was built, outside the dining room, or if they came to the front door, she would quickly get up onto the landing at the foot of the stairs and thus never be on a level with a common workman. <laughs> Therefore, things did go along more smoothly if Miss Edwards was the source of directives because she did not share Miss Benotbeck's class conscious background. So she literally didn't want to be physically on the same level mm -hmm. as anyone else. So um, she did um, become familiar with Dorset through the Alta sisters, came to visit up here, and she liked the sermons of Parsons Pratt at the Congregational Church. And she eventually came up here and moved. And in 1895, she, she bought the Dutton land. She eventually amassed 213 acres in Dorset. <coughs> and in 1896, uh, uh, and she started to build the big manor house, which has now has been torn down. So I think I can move to that. That's Miss Denotbeck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there she is. So she's her, she is a pistol. Anyway, we're moving on. This manor house, this is, this was on, uh, essentially it's about where uh, Pat and Bonnie McBride's house is. Now, where Henry Field, if you remember Henry Field, his guest house would have been. Um, and when it was willed after her death in 1933 to relatives in Europe, um, over time it got vandalized by kids. And Jean Vermette, I don't know if anybody remembers Jean Vermette. <coughs> it's hard to remember Jean Vermette as a young man. But he told me they, they just went in there and used it as a playhouse. And he remembered taking a radiator <coughs> and throwing it down the stairs and <laughs> breaking the stairs and things like that. Kevin, what street would that be on for someone that doesn't know the owners? Uh, it's off Pinnacle Lane now. Oh, it is? Okay. Off Pinnacle Lane. Anyway, she also, uh, there were, you have to remember it was mostly metal, but there were some mature trees that she had clear cut. And then she brought in trees, mature trees, to be planted. That's what the kind of gal she was. Uh, so, go on. Uh, another picture of the pinnacle. It's quite a grand house. And here is her holdings, these 213 acres that she had. She also had her own water company because up on the P Street there was in Kirby Hollow, there was a, a spring that still was just quite, quite good. Now the one that to remind you of particularly was uh, this piece right there. What that is, she needed a place for her caretaker. And she bought the Frost Place and um, built a big, big barn. The big, big barn is still there. If any of you know uh, Bill and Benka Stearns, they bought it from Roberta White, who bought it from uh, <coughs> Reese Evans, who got from his mother. Anyway, there's the little caretaker's house, and then there's this massive barn that had five stalls for teams of horses. <laughs> and the Dorset players still uh, use the upper level. And when I represented Bill and Benka when they bought, they said to me, do we have to do we have the right to kick out the Dorset players at the Dorset Theater Festival and tell them to get all their sets out of there? And I said, absolutely. But you're going to tell everybody I'm a, if I do, right? And I go, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, they, they've allowed uh, the Dorset players to continue to use it. So we're very <coughs> happy. And we also store things there from the historical society. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, but downstairs, he keeps it so they could have people yeah. have cars and things like that. This is the pinnacle before the pinnacle. Okay, before there, it was there. She did have a gazebo up there, and she loved to go up there and, uh, and just go up and uh, meditate and go up with Miss Edwards and things like that. She was schooled in England. She really liked the countryside. So in 1910, she decided to uh, construct uh, the pinnacle, which is just an empty stone tower. At the time, uh, uh, at the time, there was meadow. You could just see everywhere. <coughs> you didn't have to go in it up. And there was a little roof, just about this height, <coughs> and that's no longer there. And there was an iron grate door that was no longer there. Um, 
So it was what's called a folly. <laughs> I think that's the term. I was looking up for what you call these things on the top. <clears throat> the crown or whatever. They're not there anymore. They're on the ground. <laughs> I guess they, no one moved them. But they're, they're, they're down on the ground now. But that was the... So it was just an empty tower. Now, when I moved there in 72, everything was wooded. And right over here, there's actually marble steps going down. And in 1972, there were these huge boxwood bushes that framed the walk. And in 1987, if anyone's here from then, we had a massive 18 and a half inch snowstorm. And they took out those boxwoods uh, at that time. <coughs> so then did you say it's, it's empty all the way up? Is it there's no, nothing no there? No floors or anything? No, she no said, she no said um, uh, <coughs> what Robert Rudolph wrote was. This sandy hill did look like an English hill with a ruined tower topping it. The cattle, cattle of Major Dunton kept the hill mowed and prevented it from going to ford, forest as it is now. After she bought the land from Alan Bourne, she always had it mowed, and the tower on the top of the hill not only served to ornament the valley and make it seem English, but was also a place of refuge where she and Miss Edwards would have the coachman drive them up in a buggy to read to each other and have a picnic. There was a good roof and a ceiling and an iron grate door. Since the view was all around was clear from the ground, there was no need of stairs to, in order to see off, and she did not want any stairs lest someone fall and sue her. <laughs> uh, and like I said, uh, you know, the, the, since then the crown is off, the forest is gone, and she also had constructed in the teens uh, a series of trails that looped around the pen. <coughs> This is a few years later. You figure to have that ivy, if it was built in 1910, that's got to be about 1920, John, you think? Give or take? Does anybody here remember the field club? Golf? Okay, this is a view from the third hole. Okay, and you'll notice that that big barn, there it is, right there. And there's the mansion, and there's the pinnacle. But where we're standing from is the third hole. Uh, no, that this is a, uh, one of the new holes. Uh, it was built in 97, 94. So she started to have all these uh, trails, you know, these really nice manicured trails uh, built all around. And Robert Rudolph was one of the workers who used the stump removals and, and had it built. So this is one of the views of the trails. Here's another. But of course, now there's forest. And she had series of trees and places planted in rows. So it seems like a soldier's wedding. So when you get up to the end of Pinnacle Lane, and you're starting to go downhill, there's these 80-foot birch trees, all in rows. It's just unbelievable. Very nice. There's another view of the trees. Okay. Just a second. Um, over time, obviously, that you know, they were Abandoned, and but they the trees just that were little. I have pictures of them when they're small, they're massive now. Uh, in 1991, as part of the Dorset Bicentennial Committee, Martian Skinner and Linda Lodge were the chairman of that. If you stood next to Marcia for more than five minutes, you were on a committee. <laughs> if you stood next to her for ten minutes, you were chairing the committee. <laughs> so anyway, she wanted me to have some hikes, and we had a hike to the pinnacle. Bob Hewitt was all worried about somebody suing her. And I had to write to Bob saying that, no, you know, you can go on, you're not going to be sued. Because in the state of Vermont, if you let people on your land gratuitously for a recreational purpose, they would be treated as a trespasser for liability purposes. And under Vermont law, by statute, um, a trespasser is owed no duty. There's no such thing as attractive nuisance in Vermont. That's how the, the quarry can be. And so if somebody comes up here, breaks their leg, tough bananas, you're on your own. And the law is meant to encourage people to let people hike, fish, whatever they want to do on the land without being harmed. Okay. We're a very, very small minority of states that take that position. Okay. Um, so anyway, in 2009, the Dorset Conservation Commission 
Uh, at the time, it was Malcolm Cooper, Alan Coop, uh, Calpe, Georgine Holman, and me. Um, mostly Alan drafted a forest management plan. <coughs> and I talked about invasive species and how to do things. And we had a uh, meeting at the United Church of Dorset among all the people. Because among the one of the things we wanted to do was build a little parking lot because all the surrounding landowners used it, but it was like a big secret. People had heard about it growing up, but they didn't know, you know, how to get there or anything. Okay, so uh, we had this meeting, and we talked about the options, and was uh, narrated by, uh, moderated by Nate Feist, the forester from Bennington at the time. The first option was to do nothing. Nobody was really on board with that. Um, everybody thought, well, the trail should be maintained, you know, even if we're not paying for it. Let's do that. The separate was simply maintain the trails and <coughs> limit the trail usage to non-motorized vehicles, and that's the way it sort of developed. Another option was to improve access by vehicles uh, by uh, creating a parking area on Pinnacle Lane. All of us had our heads taken off. This caused a firestorm, and I remember asking point blank, what, you want it to be your private park that no one knows about? And they all said yes. <laughs> Another was, option was to manage the invasive plants and forest plant life. Another was to create more of a vista around the tower. There was some support for that. Another option was to create a connector trail to, to uh, Cutler Forest off Peace Street. And that garnered some support. The final option was to have some planned logging. No one objected, no one really said anything either. So anyway, since 2009, what's happened? Well. Um, we had some money left over in the town budget, so we hired Mike Stock, and he created some vistas right around the, uh, I don't know what this was, oh, okay. He created some, some vistas around the pinnacle. So now if you go up there, you do have views to the north and views to the, to the west, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, Va, uh, Rob Giotti did have clear off a parking lot on Pinnacle Lane, so if you go up there with your car, you can park there, and have access to the trails, okay? Um, I'm gonna go here. Second. Kevin, is that sign still visible? Are you? <clears throat> the sign that you had prior. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's, um, is it on Route 30? Oh, oh, okay, I'll get back to it. Yeah. I yes, you know where my office is? It's right yeah. on Dorset Village Lane and Route 30. What does huh. it say? I've never been and seen it. It says Pinnacle Tower Trail, Town of Dorset, Park on Dorset Green. Uh. <laughs> so, anyway, um, we got together, and, and, and so we did hang a small sign on Pinnacle Lane near the parking area, and that's got some you know, things saying don't you know, go by foot. Alan Calfee's led some school groups you know, up there, and in May 2021, uh, the land right behind my office and Mike Bailey's house and things, it's still owned by Laura Beckwith and also the Michaels and Mike Bailey. And all of them signed license agreements that would permit us to uh, build a connector trail. There was already a trail there people were using, but to formalize it, going up to the formal land so that you could access from, from Route 30 on foot. And um, each of them signed that, and in the case of the Beckwith property, we also agreed to brush hog the land so it wouldn't it would remain a meadow. Now these are license agreements, so they can they can um, say no, but they have to give us at least you know they're renewable every year automatically unless they give us a one month notice. So that's the way it's been since then. So then shortly thereafter, uh, town of recreation, town of Dorset recreation manager. Uh, Rachel Batts. Um, she had an intrepid crew of these Hike Dorset summer interns, and they they fell trees and they um, uh, they really improved this connector trail. So the connector trail. Well, that's that's small, isn't it? I have no idea. So this is my office, and behind my office, on there's Route 30. There's a connector trail that goes through Laura's land and the Michael's land and Mike Bailey's land and leads up to the Pinnacle Forest. It's a very easy, modern trail. Okay. So, um, 
since then, we have these license agreements and they've created better trails. Um, we've done a few things. Since 1921, since 1921, <laughs> since 2021, Rachel reports that 50 40 gallon trash bags of invasive garlic mustard plants have been removed. About 2,000 burning bush shrubs have been removed. 12 mature tall trees were felled by Rachel to increase the vista again around Pinnacle Tower. And Curtis Taylor, who's a volunteer, he lives off Hidden Hollow Lane, he continues to mow it and monitor it. You know? So yeah. aside from the burning bushes, why is that So the question? Um, the, the connecting land of, uh, if you leave just land to be by itself, yeah. it's just gonna start turning into I mean, they're beautiful, but they're a brangle. Fun. But it, they're invasive, but also it was no longer a meadow. Oh. And she wanted to, part of getting a license, she wanted this clear. Mm -hmm. And so we had to take out all of that. Okay. Um, so anyway, on the tower, this is the, the trail map to it. Let's see if I have something. Nope. Forget that. We also, um, with the help of John Matheson, Sue Washburn was his editor, um, Rachel Batts, and naturalist Tim Duclos. They've erected along the paths of the pinnacle uh, all these placards with history and, and information about invasive plants and everything. So you, if, you did, if you don't remember what I said today, not to worry, it's all along the way. They're really wonderful placards. John helped create them. He's never actually seen them. <laughs> and I don't remember leg. my involvement at all. Huh? I don't remember my involvement at all. <laughs> you were he very did. helpful, Sue. <laughs> okay. He did. Take credit. <laughs> you know, somebody compliments just say yes. <laughs> um, and so this is one of the placards in there erected on posts that are about like this. So when you go up, so just imagine, let's go back to the, the trail now. Okay, so if you go up here, and you get up here, and it doesn't say to turn right or left. Doesn't matter. Either way works. <laughs> if you go up this way to the right past where I used to live at the top of Kent Hill Road, uh, that's now Michael LeBranch owns that now. And uh, Bishop Rudolph, his house was just below. Uh, the Eric's owned this little white house. And Stephanie used to live up there. Uh -huh. um, the, it used to be Lou McGuire. Right, the across chalet. the street. That's where the Rudolphs lived, and uh, and Ruth Rudolph was kind of scary too. I remember her. Um, so anyway, you go up here, and then you go here, and then this is a steeper trail to the tower, or you can go all the way around, and this is a very mild way up, or you can go a little, again a little steeper to get there. Where is the parking lot? The parking lot. Is there? You go into Pinnacle Lane. Okay. No. There's a small parking area, and then you can. This is a very gentle way up. No. Um, as far as hikes go, it's fairly. It's fairly. Uh, it's fairly moderate. So I've kind of breezed through an awful lot of things. I don't know if you have questions or if I've left anything really out. Um, I didn't want to short trip Miss Denotbeck because. You know, one, she did some good, whether or not she meant it. She we ended up <laughs> with all these trails. But in 1922, uh, she was approached because she was a woman of means. When she died, her estate was 600, $635,000 uh, $635, in 1933. So I haven't done Google to find out what that was worth. But... Uh, we weren't taking up a collection for her. <laughs> anyway, um, she was approached by town fathers uh, because uh, they wanted to bring electricity to Dorset from Manchester, and it was going to be $5,000. And she said, I will do that. And there was a condition that she made, and that was for Dorset Village, right, in the, right near the green. She wanted all the cables to be underground. She didn't want to see poles. <laughs> And to this day, you might notice that on my side of the street, there's poles. Once you hit Cheney Road, there's poles. There's no poles. <laughs> Why is that? Cecilia did not ask for it. 
1922, she called that. So um, she had some very good points. It's hard for me to reconcile that she was a woman who was sort of stuck in the Victorian era. She had an imperious air to her. On the other hand, she was kindly to her you know, siblings that had lost their faculties. Um, she tried to be nice to other people. I just think she didn't necessarily know how. <laughs> she had strong connections to female friends. I, I, you know, I'm not saying what kind of relationship that all was, but you know, she she couldn't be open about it, you know, for certain. And uh, she tried to try to do her best. And I, I think it's kind of tragic that when she sent Miss Jefferson to meet her sister in Switzerland, her sister wouldn't. Oh. What, what is the status of the tower now? Is it in pretty good shape? Is it? Uh, that goes back to the first, first, first. Oh, yeah. Well, you showed us some pictures. No, but this is not that long ago. This is this fall. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So when I when I moved here, it was like dense forest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not so much now. But the physical, the physical, physical. Um, the top of it has been repaired some years ago. I'm told by Rachel the top probably could use some masonry again. Um, the ceiling is gone. Mm -hmm. The door is gone. People have clearly made fires mm -hmm. in, in the center of it. Um, but other than that, it's yeah. And like I said, the big boxwood bushes are gone. These marble steps are still there. They're still there. So I've got two things to quickly add before Ruth um, asks a question. Um, first, just a little useless bit of information. So Cecilia Denopic was a great granddaughter of the famous um, slave trader and um, opium dealer, uh, John Jacob Astor. And, but makes you wonder, well, gosh, what, what about Harriet Edwards? Who is she descended from? Who was her great great grandfather? Oh, that's, I forgot to say, Jonathan Edwards. Very good. From Northampton, Massachusetts, the uh, fire and brimstone preacher um, was her ancestor. So to have both of them here in Dorset with such illustrious uh, people in their family tree is kind of fun. Reverend Carhart said he, he was very, you know, um, praising of her, but he said she refused to modernize her faith. <laughs> 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 so, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, Mr. Rudolph says, his, Bishop Rudolph, the reason that she went with him is that um, that uh, uh, he, he had the original sort of strict faith. You have to also remember that um, Reverend Carhart, in his talk, in his little appreciation, he says uh, they wanted to thank her for contributing some money for the stained glass windows and the pews of the new church. As you all know, the Congregational Church burned down and they had to rebuild it, and they had to do it over a period of years. She had offered to buy, pay for everything, mm -hmm. and she did pay for some pews and things like that. And then, uh, by several sources I've had, and I remember talking to Mr. Rudolph about it, because I was at the top of Cannon Hill Road, I used to know him. Um, she started saying how the pews were to look, and how the stained glass was to look. And at some point, the good congregation said thanks but no thanks and the reason the bishop was brought up is because she wasn't going to set foot in that new church mm -hmm. where was that church the congregational church in the middle of town in, in Dorset? Dorset yeah what are we talking about it, it was a wooden down. church it burned down and they built a new stone church mm -hmm. and it was called the congregational church yeah. okay I've done legal work for them they're <laughs> Their official name is the United Congregational Church of Dorset and East Rupert, Vermont. Comma, Inc. Isn't it just called the United Church? I told Jim Gray when I was doing the boundary line adjustment with the Hasselberries, I said, you know, your real name is Congregational. And he goes, <laughs> So the second thing I want to say before I go sit back down, is a few years ago I get a call from the Barrows House and the young couple, he's British, she's American, they met while they were going to Bennington College, 
they um, had some of their first dates going to the swim in the Dorset Quarry. They've graduated from Bennington College, they've moved on, but they're getting married and they are getting married in said stone church in Dorset. And the family is staying um, from England, the family from England is staying in the Barrett's house. They're here for a week and they're bored out of their minds. Can I help out? <laughs> Maybe I could give them a historical tour of the of Church Street. And I don't want to do that. They're gonna be bored. I'm gonna be bored. We don't want to be bored. It's a beautiful summer week. So I said, how about if I give them a tour of the pinnacle? So we do that. We go up. It wasn't legal to do it yet from uh, Route 30, but I did call up Patty Michael and said, hey, Patty, can I walk across your line? She said, sure. So we walk up to the pinnacle, and they've all got the story by this time about how Cecilia did not back like Vermont, but the British landscape was better. So Vermont didn't have any medieval castle ruins, so she went about to remedy the situation. And so I had these people, these actual living people, at the pinnacle from England. And I could ask, so in your opinion, does this improve our landscape? Does it make it as beautiful as your British landscape? And the groom's younger sister, who at the time was about 19 or 20 or so, um, looked at me with a British look of disgust and disdain <laughs> and looked at the tower and looked back at me and she said, your landscape is beautiful even with that, that thing. Maybe sit down again. So Rachel has gotten, I think this might be our only copy, but there will be more, of Pike Dorset at the Pinnacle Forest. We also have them for Owl's Head and all those trails in Green Peak. Uh, Ruth, you had a question. <clears throat> How long did Cecilia occupy that space in Dorset? I mean, how long was she in Dorset? Well, the, the <clears throat> summer home, it was a summer home. She also lived in New York City. Um, she built the manor house in 1895, and uh, this was built in 1910. The, tra the trails were mostly built in the teens and the 20s, and she died in 1933. Hmm. And where did she live when she wasn't in Dorset? Uh, in New York City. You don't have the address? It said Madison Avenue, but I don't remember. So what happened to the property in New York City? Did she die, do you know? Uh, I don't think she actually owned that. That was part of an Astor residence. You know, they didn't have capital. They didn't give the capital. And it's funny that when she died, um, all of the family's holdings, the Dinopec holdings in Russia, of course, there had been a revolution in 1917. Mm -hmm. All that was lost. There was no thing. All the money came from Astor, mm -hmm. which she had never used during her lifetime. I have a question about the romantic ruin. Um, I know in the 1700s, European royalty often, or nobles often, built things to look like ruins. Did, did the Nothbeck want that to look more like a ruin than it actually was when it was built? I know? think she wanted it to look like a ruin on top of the hill. That's what Bob Rudolph said in 1985, and he knew her. I don't think, he, he described it as a folly. It's never meant to have any function really at all. I mean, it, it, it looks too all together. I'm wondering whether the workmen said, gee, we, we can't build something to look like a ruin. It so looks better now than it did in 1972, <laughs> I can tell you that. At the top, in 1972, the top of it was crumbling. Mm -hmm. And they had that fixed for safety purposes. But it never really had much of a function. But here it is, like in the middle of Dorset, between Cutler Park and, and the Pinnacle Forest, we have like almost close to 70 acres of just parkland with you know manicured trails and Cutler Park's trails are very easy too so uh, but it, it shouldn't be a secret so part of my incentive for doing this was to say try this it's, you know these are the modern trails this is an owl set you can handle this uh, I remember in the 250th anniversary the you know that one that we had of the state uh, I led a trail, and we had about 80 people going. I remember Nan Van Barrow, we came back for her because she was a little slow. slow. Um, you know, but everybody made it. We didn't lose anybody. Are there any other questions or, or comments? Or? 
Thank you. This is where I come up and um, because I'm usually more prepared than I am today, I tell you to come back for our April 3rd Thursday. I'm forgetting who it is though. <laughs> but come back anyway, be surprised we'll be ready. Oh, and um, if you if John has a paper or something, you can leave your emails. I'll we'll send you the narrative, which is more organized than the way I do. <laughs> no, I think it's